busiest summer that I've ever known. Um, it t took everything out of me. I definitely felt like I'd, I'd done a shift at the end of this summer and deadline day. Saudi Arabian Pro League can get £700,000 a week. That's £700,000 a week in his bank. That's seven times the income. It makes me laugh that they, they can't just be honest and say, I'm coming out here for the money. Was I surprised to see Gary go? Yes. Did I understand the club's thought process with regards to appointing Andoni? Yes. Standing in the situation was that Pat Sandaka was headed to Bournemouth on the proviso that Kiefer Moore was going to be headed out on loan. So I think, you know, you, you look on the outset and you certainly can see a clear philosophy largely through all of the players that they've, they've recruited. Hello and welcome to you, the Cherries Red Army followers. A fantastic video ahead of you. Do subscribe to the channel. Do hit the like button. It's a pleasure to have you, but it's a big pleasure to also have our next guest on this video. He's been on before. He's a legend. He loves AFC Bournemouth. He's from Sky Sports. He's excellent. It's Mr. Mark McAdam. How you doing, Mark? Yeah, not so bad. That's, uh, that's a big introduction now. I feel I can only let you down if I don't live up to expectations Never. over the next half an hour or so. You've kept up your record of being on the channel every year, every season since we were created. So thank you so much for that. We know you're very busy, but you've always been on hand to come on when you're available to talk the cherries and a little bit more. And Mark, we'll go into the transfer window all round. We'll talk about Bournemouth in a sort of rounded way. But how have you been? Very busy at Sky Sports. You're covering a lot of content at the moment. And I even think you've got a little bit of time to do some running. Yeah. Um, I sort of, I agreed um, to do one of Jeff Stelling's marches. He's been raising millions of pounds for prostate cancer over the last uh, 10, 12 years or so. And um, I, you know, as it was his last race, his last run, I decided to go in once again and and uh, and uh, and do the 26.2 miles. Now, my legs are aching today, so I'm certainly feeling it. However, um, it's such an incredible cause and prostate cancer affects one in eight men, uh, one in four black men. Uh, and every 45 minutes, someone dies from prostate cancer in the UK. So when you look at those statistics, it's it's obvious that needs you know stuff needs to be done. Where awareness needs to be raised, people need to be educated. People need to talk about these things. And blokes being blokes, not very many of them will go to the doctor when they've got an issue. They'll just be quiet and and shut up about these things. However, prostate cancer is curable if it's found early enough. So it's really important that if you have got an issue or something's not quite right, speak to someone. And the test is so easy. I've had multiple tests over the years. It's just, you know, literally urine in a pot and they can come back to you very quickly and say, there's nothing to worry about or we need to have a little look. But um, yeah, so that was my, my Sunday. But it brings to an end really what has been the most incredibly busy summer. Um, you go back to June the 14th when the transfer window opened. And unfortunately for me, I don't only just cover Bournemouth transfers. I have to be across what Liverpool, what West Ham, what Brighton and Aston Villa and everyone in between does as well because it's such an intense period but drives so much traction for us at Sky Sports, the transfer window. So therefore, um, yeah, the summer was probably the busiest summer that I've ever known. Um, it took everything out of me. I definitely felt like I'd, I'd done a shift at the end of this summer and deadline day. Um, but once again, it's always a pleasure to be involved in, in football and be, be involved in transfers and watch so closely uh, what the clubs do because season upon season, the activity, the money that gets spent, the commercialism, everything around football is just fascinating. And um, yeah, so um, it was deadline day number 27 for me. And wow. uh, a big chunk of those have been at Bournemouth. So it's not not too bad. Done a fantastic job as well. What I can say, and I'm happy to speak on behalf of the fans on this, is when you tweet, we start running around the living room with the shirts, we know it's getting close to a sign-in. So um, yeah, one of the trusted tweets that we can definitely trust. We are going to talk Bournemouth, but let's get stuck into the crazy transfer window. Over £2 billion spent, 
over 150 players signed. And we also had to deal with Saudi Arabia's football manager tactics. Talk us through it. (laughs) It's difficult to know where to start. Um, I think what you've seen in this transfer window is something that we've never seen before. Um, And that is a lot of clubs that were very, very tight with regards to their FFP spending. So there has been a number of sides that have had to sell players to balance the books. Um, For example, Wolves um, were a side that had to be very careful about what they did um, in the window and needed to sell a number of players to balance their financial books. The same with Chelsea. They had to get a lot of business done before July the 1st, because that's obviously when the accounting periods end and start. So players that were sold before July the 1st get put into one set of accounts, players that get sort of bought and sold after that go into the next year. So therefore, you had teams like Chelsea that had to be busy. Um, And there were a number of sides that used the newfound interest from the Saudi Pro League and their ability to spend as much, essentially, as whatever they wanted to balance their FFP commitments. And it was a good source of selling players to other clubs to generate significant amounts of money. Now, for example, you go back a year, would Manchester City have sold Gabriel Jesus and Alexander Zinchenko to Arsenal if they had could have, if they could have sold those players to the Saudi Pro League? What Manchester City were doing was making their biggest rival even stronger. And that's why a number of sides this summer chose not to sell to other Premier League sides. And if they did, they wanted to make sure they got the absolute most they possibly could. So Saudi Arabia became a really good avenue for generating huge sums of money for players that were on the fringes of squads. So it kind of really changed the dynamic of the transfer window. And obviously the money that was on offer to these players was considerably more than what they were getting in the Premier League or what they'd get elsewhere. Uh, so I think that's that's a that's a kind of really fascinating um, script to this summer's transfer window and how things evolved and developed to what they'd done in the past. And it'll be interesting to see how much they are big players in transfer windows to come, whether they just wanted to get those players in and get everyone talking about the Saudi Pro League and then it will settle down or whether in January and next summer and, and so on and so forth, they'll come back to the transfer table once again and say, we want to sign more big players. We want to get younger players. We want to keep building the Saudi Pro League so it becomes a recognised league. Uh, so that was the biggest, most single-handed um, kind of change to, to the transfer window. You had big deals that were happening as well. You had big players that were on the move, obviously with the likes of Messi and Mbappe, Declan Rice. There was so many other you know players that were were jostling between clubs. You saw a number of players come to the Premier League and turn down big opportunities in Serie A or La Liga because, once again, the Premier League draw is is massive. It's huge. Um, So I think all that in the mixing pot just created a a really, really busy summer. And, of course, we're all through the worst of the COVID times now. You know, essentially, incomes back to normal, commercial revenues up higher than it ever has been in the past. So therefore, clubs are looking forward, thinking right now we can spend this money. Whereas obviously in 2020, 2021, and to an extent 22, sides were having to be really careful financially because they were still recovering off the back of the pandemic. So yeah, it created this kind of perfect storm really in a way with with a transfer summer and uh, so many clubs chasing Manchester City uh, and so many clubs desperate to try and compete in the top half of the Premier League and stay in the Premier League. And it just meant for a really, really busy summer. It definitely was. And I am interested to see how the Saudi Pro League plays out in January, because I think we all have our opinions on why certain players have gone there. I think through my footballing, live watching it, we all expect players that are getting to the end of their career to go for a payday to the MLS. But we're seeing players in their prime going to the Saudi Pro League. And I think it's money. It's money. And I'm happy to say that, but I'm interested to see how the dynamics change because I still think the Premier League will always be the biggest league in the world. And can they unsettle that a little bit? I'm not sure, Mark. I still think they've got a long way to go. Yeah. Do you know what? Do you know what really sort of makes me laugh is that the players are going out there for the money, but no one wants to admit that they're going out there for the money. And and I, I just, I have no shame, you know, just say, for example, that, you know, the Saudi Pro League wanted to employ me and they were willing to pay me 10 times 
a week what I was earning in the UK and I decided that was the right thing for me to do, I'd be quite open to say, well, I'm getting loads of money. So that's why I'm going out here. It's, you know, that they, they can dress it up as, you know, life experience and developing the league and being a part of something new. But no, they're not. They're just going out there for the money. And and things are very different out there financially. Jordan Henderson's obviously the biggest example who's taken a lot of flack for various reasons. But if he's on £200,000 a week at Liverpool, that works out at £100,000 in his bank. He goes over to the Saudi Arabian Pro League and gets £700,000 a week. That's £700,000 a week in his bank. That's seven times the income that he was receiving in the UK, a contract worth over £100 million in three years. That's why he's going. That's the only reason why he's going. And of course, yeah, the the weather is nice. Maybe the living conditions will be better. Uh, I don't know. But yeah, I just it makes me laugh that they, they can't just be honest and say, I'm coming out here for the money. Totally agree. I think only one or two players in this world can go and change the dynamics of a country and how football is played there. And we're talking about the likes of Ronaldo and Lionel Messi. So absolutely 100% agree. One thing actually I will mention as well, Mbappe didn't want to go for the money. No. Sergio Ramos could have gone for the money and decided to go back to Sevilla. So not everyone has a price. And there are some players that can say, no, money's not important to me. Other things are important. Football's important. That's what I'm going to base my decision on. Football is important, very important to Bournemouth fans. And let's get on to Bill Foley. And before we talk about our transfer window, Bill Foley made two statements before the season really got going. The first statement, Mark, was to release Gary O'Neill as head coach with best wishes for what he achieved, keeping the club up and bring in Andoni Iriola. I know personally when this happened, I was quite happy to see it from a footballing point of view. I think it changed the dynamics. It was a game changer for the Cherries. I thought retention of potential stars in the squad could happen. And I think improving the squad could happen. And I also saw it as potential bringing back the old days on the pitch. When I'm in my seat, am I on my seat or am I out of my seat? And and I think we are going to see that. It doesn't mean, Mark, that it's going to happen. Bill Foley said that he'll live and die by the sword if we get relegated, but he's willing to take the risk. What was your thoughts, though, when Andoni Iriola came in? Well, it all happened very, very, very last minute. Um, often with these things, you get a little bit of a sniff that, that something's not quite right, something's going on. But between Gary O'Neill being told he was being sacked and Andoni being officially announced as the new manager, there was about 10 hours. That was the window uh, of kind of operation for the football club. Um, was I surprised to see Gary go? Yes. Did I understand the club's thought process with regards to appointing Andoni? Yes. So it's one of those things. And, and ultimately, we will not know um, until, say, 19 games in, halfway through the season, that's when you'll know whether it was a good or bad decision. Um, obviously, I think when Bournemouth made the decision, um, no one envisaged that Gary O'Neill would also still be working in the Premier League and um, with, a, with a club that was hoping to survive as, way, as well. So you've got a, a really tangible comparison. How many points have Wolves got? How many points have Bournemouth got? And at the halfway point of the season, if both managers have survived that long, you'll be able to turn around and say, well, actually... You know, maybe it was a good decision. Maybe it was a bad decision. You'll never know. But um, I, I like I like the fact that Bill has always put his money where his mouth is. He's yeah. always been bold with decisions. The board have clearly, um, you know, got plans in place. And if, if they don't believe in something, if they want to make a change, it's their club. It's their right to do that. Um, I think Gary would have done a solid job this season. But I guess the club didn't feel that in the 34 Premier League games they'd seen last year that he had shown enough of a philosophy and an improvement and a development and a sign, a clear sign that the club was going in the right direction. So therefore they made the decision. So we'll have to wait and see. His second statement was to say that in the transfer window, we were going to make some waves. That sort of coincided with a shirt sort of release as well, make some waves. And he also said that we were going to surprise a few people. We spent £117 million in the transfer window. We haven't got all those players on the pitch yet. We'll talk about a few in a bit. Has he sort of delivered what he said he was going to deliver before that window opened? Yes, he's delivered and some. I think when, when any owner 
spends that amount of money, particularly when you're the owner of a club like Bournemouth that doesn't have huge commercial income, doesn't have 35,000 season ticket holders, doesn't have a brand that's massive that reaches every corner of the world. Um, you know, you are investing very heavily in your recruitment staff, in the manager and everyone around the football club. And that's a clear sign from Bill Foley that, that he believes in the project. He believes in everyone and he's willing to put his money where his mouth in is in terms of, you know, signing players and pushing the club forward. So I think Bill's absolutely delivered um, as an owner should. It's a big spend. Um, and now those players really need to repay the manager and the owner and everyone in the hierarchy at Bournemouth because there's been a significant investment there. So, um, yeah, I'm, you know, once again, you know, you look at 70, 75 million pounds in January, 120 odd million pounds in the summer. That's 200 million pounds plus the money he spent to buy the club. Bill Foley has spent a third of a billion quid on Bournemouth. You know, that is massive. That is huge. Mm. You know, back in my day, £110,000 would have paid the wages for everyone for a month. And now he's spent, you know, a quarter of a billion in less than 12 months. So you can see that, that you know, what's happening around the club. Um, but yeah, once again, he's done everything that, that an owner can do. Um, it's now up to the people that he employs to show that they're worthy of that investment and, I think there's some exciting people at the football club that will clearly be trying to push that club in the right direction. It is madness, isn't it? When you absolutely look at what <laughs> we've been doing since Bill Foley's taken over, we know the training ground is well on its way down at Camford Magna. The stadium keeps getting talked about and I'm confident that we'll probably see something in that capacity in probably the next five years. It's absolutely bonkers. It really is. £117 million we spent this transfer window. Looking at the outgoings to start with, though, Mark, when I look at the players that exited the club, either on loan or permanent, Ben Pearson went to Stoke, Travis followed him with a loan, Sariki Dembele went out. Was there any outgoings that you thought, that's a shock, that's a bit of a surprise, or were they all outgoings that you probably expected with the clutch of it being that championship promotion, that January transfer deadline day, let's get some players in, we can get over the line, but maybe, maybe just not good enough in the Premier League? Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Kirk. I think there are a number of players that we signed um, in that promotion season from the Championship in the January that, that probably weren't ever really going to be Premier League superstars. But did they come in to build and strengthen the squad, to add competition for places and increase the quality in training? Did they have the right experience in the championship? Yeah, all, all those things, they, they ticked all those boxes because ultimately you gamble on spending 10 million, 15 million pounds in the hope that you get promoted and that generates 130 million pounds. And then a second season in the Premier League, another 130 million pounds. So it was almost sensible investment when you look at it with regards to the players they signed. I wasn't surprised to see any of them go. I think they all needed to go and get football. They all needed to continue their development. I think Mark Travers is a, a prime example of a of a player that's shown so much quality at times, but just doesn't have enough experience. Uh, and I think if he'd been out on loan when he was younger and played like Aaron Ramsdale, played in League One, played in a relegation battle, played in, in sides that have been fighting for things for different reasons, you would have seen a better version of Mark Travers um, at Bournemouth. So, yeah, I think all the all the outgoings were sensible. I think the squad needed to be trimmed down, save some money on the wage bill uh, and obviously get those players the opportunity to go and play regular first team football at other clubs and big clubs. And, and it certainly made sense with the business that they did. A couple I want to talk about on the outgoings before we move on to incomings was the deadline day movement between Sinistera and Jaden Anthony. Our thought on deadline day, probably something we probably didn't need was a winger. But when this came about in the day, I was thinking that Jaden Anthony probably was going to fall down the pecking order once some of these players come back fit. Tavernier, Dangu Tara, David Brooks is finding some incredible form for club and country. He would have been disappointed, Jaden, because he did start quite a few matches at the start of the season. But when you look at Sinistera, it's a different type of player that probably fronts up a fullback, where I think Jaden Anthony looks for links. Talk us through anything you know around that movement. Jaden Anthony, we're hearing, was potentially a little bit frustrated. His Instagram changed, but overnight 
everything sort of went back and he's going to try really hard for Leeds and Jaden Anthony is going to want to prove a point. Bournemouth fans love Jaden Anthony, but I do get this move and I did understand it. Yeah, so Jaden Anthony is a player that, you know, came out of the blue in that promotion season. He was one of the youngsters on the bench, one of the youngsters that was getting game time um, because of the nature of the start to the season. Scott Parker came in late. You had an ownership change. There wasn't loads of investment. And suddenly players needed to be plucked from the 23s to play in the first team. Jay-Z, Jaden Anthony, Gav Kilkenny, Mark Travers. They were players that, um, hang on, that's my alarm to tell me to speak to you at six o'clock. I <laughs> <laughs> see I set an alarm which is rare for me um, fantastic so um yeah uh, so he came came really out of nowhere um into the into the forefront of people's minds with regards to Bournemouth he was exceptional in that year in the championship and showed that he could also play in the Premier League and but like you say you know game time looked like it would have been more limited this season and for a player at his age he needed to just go and play football that was the most important thing and I think, you know, Leeds is an unbelievable club in so many ways. You look at the history, you look at the passion of the fans, you look at the size of the club. If he gets into that side, plays week in, week out and does really well, he will love, absolutely love that experience. And he will come back to Bournemouth next summer, you know, a much better player, a much better individual and much more ready to cope with the pressures of the Premier League and playing in bigger environments. Um, not to say that he didn't do it at Bournemouth because he did. But mm. I think the game time is, is key for a young lad. And that loan move could set up the, the next 10 years of his career. Uh, it really could. Uh, he wants yes. to play in the championship. He wants to play in the Premier League. He wants to play at the highest level. Um, so, yeah, so that was that. And then obviously Sinistera coming back, a player with good experience, international as well. Someone that Leeds paid, you know, in excess of 20 million quid for. Um, and, and someone that has perhaps a little bit more experience, a little bit more quality than Jaden, maybe. But um, yeah, so that was the, the last minute deadline day deal. Um, it was at quarter to 11, 20 to 11, when I found out that the deal sheet was in. But there was still a big question mark hanging over that deal as to whether it was going to get done or not. And it wasn't until about 20 past 11 when I got the message to come through that said, yeah, deal done, all sorted. Jaden one way, Sinistera the other, it's been confirmed. Uh, but that was the deal that was that was really hanging in the balance. Is there a final little bit of credit there for Andoni Iriola as well? He came out and said that he, ha he had a conversation with Jaden. He was comfortable with what Jaden wanted to do. He was happy for Jaden to stay. And first bit of management there that he had to deal with. Yeah, I think, you know, everything I hear about Andoni is positive. You know, a really good guy, really popular, really friendly, really easy to work with, deal with, speak to. His staff are, are very, very friendly as well. Um, and I guess really it would have just been a conversation with Jaden to say, look, you're probably not going to play as much as I'd like or you'd like. So this actually is is a great move. You know, if, if I was Jaden Anthony, I'd be, yeah, frustrated at leaving Bournemouth. But Leeds is, you know, it's a proper club. Yeah. You know, I know there's been history between the two, the two clubs in the past. And, um, you know, there's all sorts of other incidents that have occurred. But Leeds is a proper club. And it's a proper place to play football. And when Ellen Road is bouncing, there are very few places in the country that are better to watch football at. So I think he'll, he'll love it. I think he'll love every second mm. of that loan move, providing he gets the game time. Uh, and yeah. I think it could be really exciting. I did say when it happened, Mark, I did say, is it OK to wish Jane Anthony well, but do we have to have Leeds promoted? But that's for me. That's what I said. Um, <laughs> Another one I want to talk about before we talk about some really exciting sign-ins. It was deadline day again and potentially loan movements again that was happening. Kiefer Moore potentially going on loan out and Dakar coming the other way from Leicester. Now, I do want to put, point something out there. I think that Kiefer Moore has come under a lot of stick in the last three months. I think he was fantastic when he came into the side. He saw him for us. He instantly got injured. He came off the bench and scored goals at Swansea. He scored the vital goal against Forest. He scored on the final day against Millwall, so he had a proper celebration. He opened our Premier League campaign with a goal. He scored goals against Tottenham when we nearly beat them. And his form dipped a little bit when he fell out the side and wasn't getting as many minutes in the second half of the season. On his day... Kiefer Moore, for me, is a fantastic striker, but he has missed a lot of chances in that inconsistent form. Fans were getting excited, though, Mark, when they saw potentially Dakar come the other way. I can see this signing. Someone with pace, directness, running in behind. 
Does Daka blow me away in stats? Not really. I don't think he delivered what Leicester hoped he was going to deliver. Some serious numbers in Austria, only four goals, three goals, something like that. Maybe not the game time he was hoping for. But what stopped it? Do we know why that didn't go through? Um, ultimately, my understanding of the situation was that Pat Sandaka was headed to Bournemouth on the proviso that Kiefer Moore was going to be headed out on loan. And Kiefer Moore didn't go out on loan. So therefore, the Pat Sandaka deal didn't happen. I think it was as simple as that. I think, like so many clubs, they only let players go, providing they've got a replacement lined up. So Daka was the replacement. And then, of course, Kiefer Moore... Uh, didn't end up travelling to Norwich or Millwall or any of the other sides that had expressed an interest in him initially. So I think that one's quite a simple one. Again, it's it's one of those things you sort of mentioned it at the top of the show that, you know, ideally that doesn't come out in the media. You know, the, the Pats and Dacca to Bournemouth thing didn't need to come out in the media because ultimately it didn't happen. So... Mm-hmm. It's it's kind of that 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 deal was a victim of the transfer speculative world that we work in these days, where every single phone call from every single club to every single agent is suddenly thrust into social media, and people think, oh, they're going to sign him, they're going to sign him. Well, not always the case. Hence, why I try to try so hard to only put information out there that's accurate, or well, certainly accurate at the time, but there's a strong chance of the deal happening. Um, because, again, you could put all sorts of things out there, but actually, if you only get 25% of it right, then what you say holds no credibility. Um, so, yeah, that's one of those that came out. There was an interest. It didn't work out for whatever reason, but essentially my understanding was it was one in, one out. One in, one out, but there were quite a few ins, Mark. Let's get stuck into the new signings for AFC Bournemouth. We had Hamad Traore confirmed as a permanent deal after a loan deal from January. Justin Cliver, Roman Favre came in but went back out on loan to Lorient. Milos Kerkes, Radu, Max Ahrens, Alex Scott, Tyler Adams. We talked about Sinistera. I don't quite know where to start, to be honest with you. <laughs> what I do think is the recruitment team have had a plan which I think has been very, very good, and they've delivered on a good plan. We'll talk about some frustrations in a moment in some of those signings, but very youthful, very energetic, with lots of potential. Yeah, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I think Bournemouth always generally try and have a bit of a plan as to what they want to do. Obviously, from from Eddie Howe to Scott Parker to Jonathan Woodgate to Gary O'Neill, the kind of the manager, the head coach changes. So therefore their their kind of desire for certain players changes as well. So I think that that's something that's that's sort of really, you know, got to be sort of brought in mind because whilst the club have their recruitment team and they do things in a certain way and they employ a head coach, they still obviously listen to the head coach and the types of players that he wants and they'll try and source those. Um, but yeah, you can see a clear philosophy. These, these are young, exciting players that can play a certain brand of football. Um, they're all in the, the same kind of age bracket. They all have great engines, great great stamina stats. They can work and run, which is something that Andoni wants for this Bournemouth side. So I think, you know, you, you look on the outset and you certainly can see a clear philosophy largely through all of the players that they've they've recruited. Um, obviously, the, the two big names that, that stand out are the two big signings, I guess, Alex Scott, who was probably the standout player in the championship last season and someone with huge potential, someone hugely exciting. And then, of course, Tyler Adams, who's a player that's been watched, actually. He was being watched by by Eddie Howe's recruitment team um, uh, back, you know, many years ago when he was in the Red Bull group. So he's mm. a player that's been on the radar for Bournemouth for a number of years. He was watched by Arsenal as well quite, quite considerably at one stage and looked like he might even head to North London. Uh, obviously, he ended up going to Leeds. You know, he was one of those players that that, that fell um, fell into the bracket of being given a really good release clause, um, which allowed, should, should they get relegated, allowed them essentially to, to leave. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's another one. But unfortunately, both of those two players, the two marquee signings that cost best part of £50 million, pounds, are both injured at the moment. Um, but there are gambles that are always taken in transfer windows when you're signing players. Some players, um, 
are injured and you don't think it's worth the gamble and some players are injured and you do think it's worth the gamble and you just have to decide which ones you, you go for and which ones you do. Um, but I think Alex Scott will be sometime yet, unfortunately. But I think Tyler Adams is, is getting much closer now to being being involved. And I think when you get those two players into the side, uh, I think there could be some some really exciting, you know, lineups there to look forward to. Um, the other players that you, you've mentioned, obviously, Milos Kerkes, met him for the first time last week. Super big character, super big personality. You'll hear him before you see him. Uh, but I, I quite like that. I like that energy around the, the training ground. Um, and I think he could be could be really exciting as well when he develops. Max Aaron's, you know, was linked with Barcelona a couple of years ago. They actually went to Norwich City and inquired about taking him on loan. And obviously, Norwich City were never going to turn around and say, well, yeah, we'll loan you one of our best players for free um, just because you're Barcelona. Um, so, you know, the fact that they were interested in him shows the type of player he is. And he's still young as well. Obviously, Sinister, we spoke about, we know about Triore. So I think when you look at the whole collection of eight, nine players that have come in over the summer, there's a lot of reasons to be hugely excited. Yeah, some absolute top performances from some of those players you've mentioned already. Kirk has, I think, picked up Player of the Month already in his first section of the season. Max Ahrens was in beast mode against Chelsea. He dealt with Sterling very well and Madrid. So some really top performances. I was going to ask if you could maybe give us a little bit of hope around Alex Scott and Tyler Adam. I think Alex Scott might be posting with his football boots. But yeah, we, we do know that he is a little while away. We do feel, though, and I do feel, that Tyler Adams could be a bit of a game-changer in the middle of the park there. Lewis Cook has stepped up, to be fair, against Chelsea. But we are looking for that enforcer. We know we lost Lerma, and I'm really excited to see how Tyler Adams fits into this. Yeah, I think he could be could be a, a big part of that missing jigsaw. Um, not only his ability to defend and, and play as the pivot in midfield, but someone who could also get forward and create chances. He's comfortable on the ball. He's a USA captain. You know, if you're signing a captain, an international captain for your, your team, regardless of whether he's your captain or not, that shows you a lot of the characteristics and personalities that the player has. So there's no question about his ability in that regard. I think if he's a real leader uh, on the pitch as well, that would be that would be massive. Um, and I think you'll see a very different form of side when you start to get some of these players fit and back and, and ready to, to go again, which hopefully won't be too far away now. Um, but yeah, he's a player I've always liked and um, he's a player that I, I know has been watched by a lot of sides in the Premier League. So yeah, that, that could be the most exciting piece of business. He was so close to joining Chelsea. Now, I know Chelsea are not the Chelsea of old, but the fact that they were willing to, to take him into yeah. that squad under Pochettino shows you how much they rated him and respected him. Even if the deal didn't quite get done, I think that shows you that potentially that could be a real coup for Bournemouth. Although I think Chelsea just want to sign everyone, don't they, Mark? Yeah, they pretty just much, want to sign yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, a couple of new contract extensions to help us deal with Jeff Lerma leaving on a free. Now, the first one I am surprised with. I thought Philip Billing might be going for a new challenge after his very, very good career at Bournemouth so far. We know it was a struggle at the start, but he's developed into a beautiful footballer who's added significant numbers ultimately scored goals that kept us in the Premier League last season. Signed an extension, though, Mark. Was there interest in Philip Billing, though? Because it did feel to me like there might be a new challenge ahead of Phil. Yeah, I think that one certainly came as a bit of a surprise to me. I know that Phil, you know, is a very confident player, backs himself and wants to play at the very highest level. Um, I think consistency has probably been the reason why he's not been in a big six side. I know that Philip Billing has had opportunities to leave Bournemouth over the years. There's been interest in him from other sides in the Premier League, in Europe and the Championship. And every time he's had the opportunity to leave, he's declined that opportunity. Um, so therefore, I think his heart really is in Bournemouth. I think he's probably found, you know, the last six, 12 months a bit tough. Um, but clearly he finds Bournemouth the right place for him at the moment. He knows that if he plays his very best football, um, the club won't stand in his way. If, if you know, like all players, if if there's a value on a player, and they want to go, providing the money is what Bournemouth feel is acceptable for a player of his quality, then they'll let them go. Um, so therefore, I think you know, even though you sign a new contract, I think that 
that allows you the opportunity to leave should you know should the numbers make sense. So um, yeah, that one was a little bit of a surprise to me. I think the Dom Solanke one was was great business. He was 26 last week. I know he hasn't got the numbers that we'd all hope for him in the Premier League, but he's always been a consistently hard-working performer. I think his off-the-ball work has got even better over the course of the last six to 12 months. Uh, be interesting to see in what direction Andoni can take his game. He's got a couple of goals in the Premier League already so far this season. So I think he's got off to the right start. He just needs to start getting those goals that his hard work deserves. Um, so, yeah, great to see him uh, getting getting a new deal. Um, but, but and on the Jefferson thing, some players, you know, he came in, he signed a five-year contract. He stayed with the club when they got relegated. He stayed with the club to get back up. And then his contract comes to an end and he leaves. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know. No. The, you know, that, that that's football. You know, players that are agitating for a move, putting in a transfer request, not turning up to training, causing a nuisance around the place. They're the players you have a problem with. Jefferson Lerma was the most professional player to the very last moment. And even when it got to the end of the season and Bournemouth were safe, and he probably knew that he would be leaving, he still carried on playing and he still gave 110%, even though an injury could have changed the whole summer for him. Um, so I, I, I absolutely take my hat off to him. And, you know, I don't think Palace is the greatest move in the world, but no, no, no problem with, with that. I think he probably could have got a better side. You know, you, you look at Chelsea, we're looking for a six. You look at Man <laughs> City, looking for a six. You look at Man United, looking for a six. Jefferson Lerner on a free transfer may have done a job for one of those big sides as a squad player, um, particularly those that, you know, Newcastle, particularly those that have got Champions League football. Um, and they've got to play, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday. You know, you need strength yeah. and depth and where better to get an experienced player at a good age than Jeff Lerma. Um, but yeah, no, no problem with him departing at all. Um, that's football. Yeah. I just still miss him, Mark. I'm not going to lie. And I still see some moments in the football match. And I think Jeff wouldn't, Jeff wouldn't make that, let that happen. But uh, Tyler Adams, he's on his way. He's on his way. Um, just quickly on Dom Solanke that you mentioned his new contract. What's the reason? He had a healthy contract anyway. Like you've said, the fans, he is a fan's favourite. They do back him. We do want more goals. We do want him to score more regularly in front of those posts. But interest again. I mean, is it to say to West Ham, I'm staying at Bournemouth? I think it's a, a number of things, really. A, to turn around and say to, you know, any potential club that wants to take Dom Solanke, he's not cheap. You know, he cost Bournemouth a significant amount of money. He's been here for a number of years. He's shown that he has a lot of quality. Too good for the championship. You know, we saw that. Um, and in the Premier League, he's developing as well. And I think, you know, let's be honest, that chance against Chelsea, suddenly he sticks that in right at the end. And you turn around and go, well, three goals in five games. That's 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 the st sort of start you'd expect from a top class striker. Um and, you know, he's got some tough games to come, but he could, you know, he could notch up some some goals against some of the, the sides currently in the bottom half of the Premier League. So, yeah, I think there was interest in him. I don't think it was as serious as what people um, were led to believe in the media. Um, you know, you know like, like Lloyd Kelly, for example, you know, an offer that comes in that that's barely what, you know, they paid for him. So, you know, Bournemouth are never going to sell a player. If you pay... 100 million for someone, you're not going to sell him for 100 million. You want to sell him for 200 million. Um, so, you know, regardless of what the figures were, you know, certain offers and certain noises that get get made, particularly through social media and the greater media, are just to kind of grease the wheels of the deal and, and get people talking as opposed to being genuine, serious offers. I just mentioned West Ham because they always seem to come in with a... I don't know, an interest on our strikers. I mean, how many years did they chase Callum Wilson? But it is great to see Dom Solanke sign a new contract. And I think he can really focus on getting down to becoming a better striker and an even better striker and scoring more goals. It's like you've written the script or you've seen the script, Mark, because the next question was Mr. Lloyd Kelly, yeah. who has also been had his troubles with AFC Bournemouth fans. A, a guy that came in under Eddie Howe with lots of promise. Was he going to be a left back? Was he going to be a centre back? Under nearly every manager, he's played both of those positions. I think as a defender, if you want to play Lloyd Kelly up against a powerful striker or someone with pace, you, you want to play Lloyd Kelly. 
I think for me, it's always been around his passing. It's only ever really been my frustration with him, his speed of passing, how consistently he 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 gets the accuracy right with his passing. But as a defender, he's probably right up there, even now with the likes of Sabani and Sanessi in there, as one of our best defenders proved it against Chelsea. But deadline day, interest from Tottenham. I think we also asked a question about Eric Dyer. Don't know if that's true or not, but Lloyd Kelly's contract is getting rather low now. Going to go into January, I've stuck up for Lloyd Kelly quite a few years and, and I really like Lloyd Kelly, but I am worried that we're going to lose a really good player for potentially nothing when the ball moves into his court. I was worried about his how he's going to approach football matches with that in his mind. He proved to me against Chelsea that he's focused on the job. He played for the badge. I mean, how should we feel about this Lloyd Kelly in the next three months and when we get to January? Well, I think ultimately you, you judge Lloyd Kelly on how he plays for Bournemouth every Saturday. Um, you know, forget about the contract situation. Forget about the transfer speculation. That's irrelevant. And and if and if he walks away on a free transfer, then then so be it. You know, um, you know. Let's be honest. Lloyd Kelly was booed by his own fans. You know, so if you're Lloyd Kelly, you're going to want to stay at the football club when it feels like you're not wanted by certain sections of the support. Um, no, you're not. And if you want to go and improve your career, you want to play for a bigger club, you want to earn more money, then you leave. And and that's just the nature of, of these things. Um, what did he cost? 12 million, 13 million, 15 million, something like that, right? You know, 12, 13, rising to 15. You know, and if he walks away on a free transfer, then 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 so be it. But um, obviously the club now potentially could try and offer him a new deal, offer him a, a year's extension. You often see a lot of clubs say, well, OK, we know that you you want to go. You know, we've been good to you. We've supported you. We've stood by you when you've been injured. Why don't you sign a year's extension? But we will put a release clause in there that allows us to recoup, the, you know, a decent level of money for you um, instead of walking away on a free. Um, you know, David Raya did it at Arsenal. Um, and you've seen another of, you know, a number of other players that have signed extensions to protect their value and help the club that they're at. So that potentially could happen. It could become you know, superstar player for Andoni. Uh, he could get a brilliant move. He could sign for a European club in January. I don't know. I think the only thing that matters with regards to Lloyd is that he's he's valued and loved by the supporters because he puts on the Bournemouth shirt and that's all that matters. And that he's allowed to be the best version of himself. And of course, with Lloyd, you just want him to be fit as well. You want his body to hold up and you want him to be available week in, week out because he has faced a number of injury concerns and problems and he's just not been able to get that regular run of of games in the side as well. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite relaxed on that situation. I think, um, you know, let's, let's judge him, you know, after he's played 10, 15 games and get to January and then, and then see where we're at. And don't write off that Bill Foley can't have another little say in this. And you never know if we start climbing the table, maybe a new contract might be on the table. Like you said, there's always little bits in the contract that can suit both parties. And for me, if, if the Lloyd Kelly of Sunday against Chelsea turns up regularly, I'll be more than happy and he performs to the club, keeps us up, maybe puts us 12th, 13th in the league or contributes towards that. I'm, I'm sure I'll be happy. But yeah, I can only agree with you with regards to some of the stuff he's received from the fans. And if we back Lloyd Kelly, he's shown how good of a defender he is. So before we sort of close out this podcast and YouTube video and get your opinions and predictions on the season for Bournemouth and, and Brighton, is there anything that we didn't, quite get right in the transfer window what I'm saying is is there some tricks that we went for that didn't come off or did we literally everything we planned out did we pretty much nail um I'm trying to think of things that potentially did or didn't happen that were that were looking likely to to happen I know the club worked you know as hard as they've ever worked to try and sign players um you know you're competing in a in a difficult market um where prices are overinflated and, you know, they, they have to be careful. They have to be sensible. You know, as a, as a fan, I want I don't want Bournemouth, you know, 117 million quid's worth of money spent in one window. It doesn't always sit um, brilliantly with me. Um, but that is the nature of the transfer market at the moment. You know, the, you look at every single piece of business, every single club that spent money, they would have said, well, yeah, ideally, we wouldn't have liked to have spent that much on that player. But it, it market forces, you, you know. You either go and get the, these players for the, the price or you just accept you're not going to get them. 
Um, so therefore, you, you just have to accept that the money is what it is. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, the, the, the work that's been done is is good. I think it's effective. I think there's young, exciting, hungry players there. I think everything that, you know, the club is standing for and the, the values they have are important. I think the, the, there's a lot of excitement and buzz around new manager, training ground, stadium, you know, the ownership. Everything is headed in the right direction. I think patience is required. Um, you know, we've played, you know, what, five games, lost yeah. two against yeah. Liverpool and Tottenham. Um, we've drawn games, you know, Brentford's a good draw against, you know, really, really difficult side. I know it was a last minute equaliser, so you get frustrated there, but, you know, still a good point on the road. Point against Chelsea, regardless of their league position, is is a good point. You know, the point against West Ham looks like being a really good point because they've had a brilliant start to the season. They've been really effective and they're back to where they were before the troubles they had of last season. I think really, the, you know, the, and the next games, you know, Brighton, Arsenal, Man City, they're going to be hugely difficult games. Um, so if Bournemouth have got three points by the next international break, then you just go, well, OK, fine, let's let's judge the team by the performances. But it's going to be that next run of fixtures against those teams in and around the bottom six, seven, eight. That's where you really judge the manager um, and judge the team. You know, let's get 10, 12 games finished then you can start to get a, an idea about how the team's shaping up, how they're looking, how they're playing. Uh, and then you can start to formulate ideas. So once again, patience is key. Um, but I think everything there is is in place. Let's let's just be patient, support the team, enjoy every match day and, and then see where we are in, in kind of six, eight, ten games time and, and then start to formulate ideas and plans about how things are going and whether it's going right or it's going wrong. It was always going to be a tough start to the season when the fixtures come out. And when you look at the points we picked up, the, those fixtures that we looked at last season, exactly the same fixtures, we didn't pick any points up. So I said this a few weeks ago on the channel, you can switch it up how you want, you can view it how you want. But I think it's a new process. It's a new era, new style, new players. I'm very happy with where we are right now. And what is the plan for Bournemouth this season then, Mark, in your opinion? Is it to improve that style under Andoni Iriola? Is it just to have exciting football? Is it try and finish 12th or higher? What's the prediction for us as a club? What should we look in, be looking to achieve? Well, for, for me, I, I say the same thing all the time. It's quite boring, but 17th plus, you know, yeah. you stay in the Premier League. That's, that's the most important thing. Um, that keeps everything settled financially. And, you know, if you can do that and then look to build, of course, last season we finished on 39 points. We finished 15th. So ultimately, you'd say, well, let's try and get more than 39 points and let's try and finish higher than 15th. The, the league position doesn't always tell you the, the true story of the season um, because ultimately, you know, there are 38 games and three points to win. So let's try and win more games than we did last year. Let's try and pick up more points than we did last year. And hopefully in retrospect, that will leave you in a higher position in the table. I think, you know, play exciting football, um, you know, that's that's key. That's that's one of the most important things. Be competitive against the big sides. Um, be together, be united as a, as a community, as a fan base, as a club. Um, support everyone at the club, support the players, support the manager. Let's have a really healthy atmosphere and environment. Let's have a passionate atmosphere and environment. Make it, make it tricky for away fans because we know that whilst we don't hold... 40, 50, 60,000 people at the Vitality, when we sing, when we play our football, it can be a really brilliant and intimidating place to come if you're an away fan and an away player. So I think those values and morals are really important. Um, but for me, just let's just carry on building. Let's keep this club in the Premier League. Let's keep doing what we're doing well. Let's keep developing young players and play exciting football. And I think ultimately that's that's the most important thing for any Bournemouth fan. Probably unfair of me as well, but if I was to put you on the spot, Mark, who would you predict to be an outstanding performer for the Cherries or the most exciting player you think come 38 games has been an outstanding player for us? Um, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, yeah, put you on the spot. No prep work. I'd, I'd like, I really, I really want to see Elias Zabani develop as a, as a centre-half. Um, yeah. I think, you know, he was so unlucky when he came in injury-wise, that he just couldn't get that run of games. Um, again, I, I'm looking forward to seeing Tyler. I'm really looking forward to seeing Alex Scott. I think he was played 
far too deep as a, as a midfielder at Bristol City. I think Bournemouth will want to play him more as an eight and a ten as opposed to a six. So I think that's an exciting one to watch. Um, obviously, Kirkes is a player with huge energy and, and passion. He could be a superstar. Um, you know, Sinister as well. I think that, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's one player I can pick out, um, but I think there's a number of players that, that could be, you know, the types of players that next summer, bigger Premier League clubs are saying, mm, how much for him? Because we like mm. him and he's done well. And ultimately, that's what that's what we want. We want we want other clubs looking at our players, saying we want to we want to triple your investment. You know, you pay twenty for him, but we want to pay pay you fifty for him because we believe he's he's that good. Um, and of course, David Brooks. I think that is yeah, that's the the best story of 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 any Bournemouth player really. Um, you know, he's 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 been exceptional in the last few weeks. Uh, three and three at one stage for for club and country. Um, and just to see him on that pitch just fills me with immense joy week in, week out. And that's and that's what I love. So great. David Brooks is such a guy and he's been outstanding. He's so on it. He wants it this year as well. Absolutely wants it. Easier prediction then uh, coming this Sunday, because this is hopefully going out before the Brighton fixture. It's Deserby Ball against Iriola Ball. Massive respect to Brighton. Love what they're doing. It's definitely a model that we're trying to follow. Bill Foley said that Deserby is on his way to great things. Proper head coach, by the way, doing proper things. And um, I'm excited to see this. Look, do I think we can get something good, Brighton? Hopefully. They have got a Europa League game on Thursday, so maybe that can trip them up. They've never been in that experience of Thursday, Sunday. Early prediction, can you give us a thought for that Sunday fixture at the Amex? Well, one thing that, that De is very good at, and by the way, I'm going to keep saying this to as many people that will listen, I think De will re replace Pep Guardiola at Man City, Agreed. whether it's next summer or the summer after. I think that's that's what will happen. So I'm trying to put that out there as much <laughs> as I can so that people can come back and say, you were right. Um, you heard it here first. One thing, <laughs> one thing about the Europa League, yeah, this is new for Brighton, playing on a Thursday and then a Sunday. Yeah. But De Zerbi, is not afraid to chop and change, make three, four, five changes. So he will probably make three or four or five changes for the Europa League and then do the same for the Prem, and it doesn't affect them. Um, you know, I would take a point now because I know how good Brighton are and I know, yeah. you know, they've just turned over Man United at Old Trafford. So I think a point would be a really, really good result. Maybe, maybe they have an off day because they do have odd off days and we can go and snatch three points. Um, but ultimately, whatever happens, just go and compete. Be the best version of ourselves. Hopefully surprise a few people. Play well individually. Play well collectively. Um, and uh, yeah, fingers crossed we'll, we'll pick up something and just, just keep the sort of positive vibes going. And I don't know if you saw as well. I saw this on Twitter from a fan account and I'm taking it that it's true. But that squad that was on the pitch against Manchester United spent was less than £17 million. How they acquired those players. Bonkers. Yeah. Yeah. Madness. Brilliant. But that's that's Brian. One of the best run clubs, yeah. not just in the Prem or the UK, but in the world. They are outstanding at what they do. And I love watching them. I love going to watch games. I think they're they're really class, class set of... Um, of people that are connected to that club. So, uh, yeah, I like, but I've got a big soft spot for Brighton. And not really Bournemouth, but I think it's a nice way to finish off. You've watched Eddie Howe grow as a player, as a head coach. He's going into this week, probably by the time this is aired, it's already gone, but he's going into his first Champions League fixture as a head coach, taking Newcastle. There were some... You know, sports fans going around, go and see it. It was a one-off last year, what he did. And it's like, God, this guy is a genius, right? If he has a few dodgy results, that's fine. Newcastle fans have got his back. I'm confident of that. What an experience this is going to be for Eddie Howe. And you know him really well. I mean, what's going through your mind? I mean, you're going to be watching him coach a Champions League side. Immense pride. Immense pride. And I think that should be the emotion that every single Bournemouth fan has because they were a huge part of, of his journey. Whether it was Eddie Cher when they signed him as a player in the latter stages of his career um, or, or anything else that, that, has, that he achieved at Bournemouth. You know, we all know how special he is and Newcastle fans know how special he is. And this is, will be a hugely exciting and special moment for the for the club once again back in the Champions League, which is where the fans believe they they belong. It just I always just go like AC Milan, but that first game Darlington away um, was was Eddie's first game, and it just uh, 
the contrast in in fixtures, you know, from 2009 to 2023 is is quite astonishing. Um, but um, I'm sure he'll give you know those Newcastle fans something to be really proud of. And um, yeah, he, he might be doing it at Newcastle, but we all know he was born in Bournemouth. Absolutely, 100%. Good luck to Eddie Howe, JT, the rest of the guys that have come from Bournemouth and doing some great stuff at Newcastle United. We've had lots of discussions with Mark McAdam here on the channel, on the podcast. Do get your thoughts in the comments below. Do subscribe, do hit the like button, follow our podcast as well. Mark, thank you so much for your time. Not sure how busy we'll be in January because we spent £117 million pounds this <laughs> summer, so I'm not sure you... Obviously, keep keep up the great work. Thank you for your time. Keep doing the great stuff. And hopefully we may speak to you in the future again. Definitely. Cheers, Kirk. Thank you to you, the fans, checking out this video. Take care. Look after yourself. Follow the cherries. And we'll see you on the next video. Up the cherries. <laughs>